armed with our newfound information about elastic collisions, let's consider some hockey pucks undergoing a perfectly elastic collision. We have two hockey pucks and we've got a description here that I've drawn a diagram to try and make more clear. We have one hockey puck traveling to the left that hits another hockey puck that's at rest. And then afterwards we have some unknown velocities. We know the masses of the pucks and we know the initial velocity of the blue puck coming in. And we want to know what that final velocity of the blue puck and the final velocity of the red puck are. So that's two unknowns. We can write our conservation of momentum expression in our x direction as before, where the initial momentums, mb, vbi, plus this, but this is zero, it's not moving, so just mb, vbi, is equal to my final momentum of my system. Because we have two parts of our system, we include both of those, mr, vrf, and mb, vbf. We can do this because we've taken our system as both pucks together, so the interaction between them when they bang on each other is internal to our system. It's not an external force acting from outside our system. And we have two unknowns. We can't solve for two unknowns with just one equation. We need a second equation. Luckily, we know that this is a perfectly elastic collision, which means that we can write a conservation of energy statement due to that elastic nature of the collision. We know that the final kinetic energy has to equal the initial kinetic energy of our collision. Looking at my diagrams, I can write my initial kinetic energy is just coming from the blue puck, 1 half mb vbi squared, and my final kinetic energy is coming from both pucks, 1 half mr vrf squared plus 1 half mb vbf squared. At this point, we have two equations, two unknowns, and we solve this equation and this equation simultaneously to get vrf and vbf. I'm going to do it algebraically here. You can do it graphically. You can do it numerically. Plug these in, graph them, find where things intersect. You do you how you want to solve these. I'm going to show you algebraically. It gets a little bit of a pain the way I did it. Maybe there's a faster way. This is how this goes. Turns out that there's a trick at the end that I'll show you that can make your life easier for this special case. But in general, here's how you solve two equations, two unknowns. Prepare yourself for algebra. We'll call this equation E for energy. And we will solve our momentum equation for one of these, VBF, in terms of the other stuff in the equation and then substitute it back into our energy equation. So solving that, we get VBF in terms of the other terms. That's subtracting this term to the left side and then dividing by MB. And now we're gonna substitute this back in for VBF here. We'll call this equation B because we'll need to come back later, but the hope is that as we solve one equation for VBF and plug it into this other one, we'll now have one equation, one unknown with just VRF as the unknown in this equation. So the plan is we get substitute in so that we can get just VRF as our unknown, solve for VRF, and then later we can come back and plug VRF in here to get VBF. That's our plan. As we substitute this in, we notice that we're going to have to square this and get a lot of terms and it's going to get a little bit ugly. So let's give ourselves a little bit more space here. Starting where we were and noting we're trying to solve this for VRF. That means expanding this term. So here we go, expanding this term and I'm highlighting our VRF as blue here so that we can keep track of what we're trying to solve for. Here I've pulled the MB squared out in front so we have an mb over mb squared, a little bit of that's gonna cancel. And then when we expand this, this is this times itself. So the first term gets squared. We get minus two times the combination of all these terms together. And then we get the second term gets squared there. Hang with me. All right, so now we can try and distribute. This will end up as one over two mb that we can distribute to each of these terms. We'll distribute it. So we get 1 half mb vbi squared minus mr vbi vrf because this mb cancels with the 1 over mb as we distribute this to that term. And then the last term is mr squared over 2mb vrf squared. 
keeping track of our VRFs, we've got one, two, three terms here with VRF in it. We're going to try and move this term here to the other side by subtracting it from both sides. And we'll rewrite this. So this VRF squared term, we can combine with this VRF squared term by factoring out that VRF squared, and now we get those together. So our VRF squared times this coefficient, 1 half MR, plus the other coefficient, MR squared over 2MB, gives us those two terms, and then we're left with just this remaining term. Luckily, this term canceled out. Yay. All right, we're almost there. We have, it looks like a squared term and a non-squared term. By being a little bit clever here, honestly, it's not that clever, we can factor out the VRF, right? We have a VRF and a VRF squared. It's like if you had X and X squared, you can factor out an X. That's all we do here. We factor out that VRF, and now we're left with VRF times this thing minus MRVBI from that second thing. So we just factored out a single VRF from each of those. All right, that's most of the algebra we're doing. Feel free to pause it, go back, verify for yourself that all of this is fair and kosher and I did not cheat at all. At this point, we can say that since zero is equal to this product, either the first term has to be zero, VRF, or the inside of this has to be zero. Let's focus on the interesting case that's the actual one we're interested in, which is that these things are moving after. And we get that this has to equal zero. You can also think about dividing by VRF. I'm just pointing out that if VRF happens to be zero, then that's a solution too. But assuming it's not zero, let's move on. And now we can add MR VBI to both sides, divide by this coefficient, and we get VRF in terms of our system parameters. This can actually simplify a little bit because we have an MB on the bottom here. We might want to multiply by MB on the top and the bottom to cancel out that MB. And while we're doing that, we might as well multiply by two on the top and the bottom to cancel out the one halves in our denominator. So we end up with two MB VBI over, also, we've got MRs on both of these terms, so you can factor that out and cancel that out. So it simplifies. We get not a crazy, ugly expression at the end. You can plug in the values from the problem statement and get a final velocity of the red puck of 2.2 meters per second to the left in the direction we had assumed. And then we substitute it also into back into that equation B from the previous slide. And we end up with VBF as a negative. So that means it actually bounces back in the direction it came from. This makes some sense since the blue puck is less weighty than the red puck. It bounces into the red puck and the red puck moves while the blue puck bounces back a little bit. And so it ends up with a negative velocity. All right, I promised you that there was a little bit of a trick here. It turns out if you have a normal elastic collision where you're hitting head on like this, the difference in your final velocities is equal to the negative of the difference of your initial velocities. Here, I've got that written as VBF minus VAF is equal to the negative of VBI minus VAI. So that's true for this particular case. This you can think of as an expression of your conservation of energy. It's not going to be generally true for things, but for elastic collisions where you have a normal head-on collision like that, this relationship will be true, and it'll make your algebra in solving two equations, two unknowns, less of a pain.